Well, again, thanks so much for being here. Uh, I'm Dan Slater. I'm the, the director of the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies, WCED. And our session today on America's democratic vulnerabilities draws on a forthcoming special issue of the same name, which will be coming out in the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. Uh, its co-editors will be Suzanne Mettler and Tom Papinski from Cornell University and Robert Lieberman from Johns Hopkins University, all of whom are joining us today. And this session is kicking off our year at WCED like last year's ended with our emergency roundtable last April on the theme of submerging democracy in America's states. So let me begin by briefly introducing our panelists. Trevor Brown is a PhD student in government at Cornell University. He studies American politics with a focus on political economy, American political development and economic inequality. Jake Grumbach, who will be joining us shortly, is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Washington. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley in 2018 and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton. His book project, based on his award-winning dissertation, investigates the causes and consequences of the nationalization of state politics since the 1970s. Robert Lieberman is Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. He studies American political development, race and American politics and public policy. He has also written extensively about the development of American democracy and the links between American and comparative politics. His most recent book is Four Threats, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy, which is co-authored with Suzanne Mettler, to whom I now turn. Suzanne Mettler is the John L. Senior Professor of American Institutions in the Government Department at Cornell University. She's the co-editor, along with Robert Lieberman and Kenneth Roberts, of an edited volume that's due out this fall entitled Democratic Resilience, Can the United States Withstand Rising Polarization with Cambridge University Press. She's also a founding member of the American Democracy Collaborative, a group of scholars of American political development and comparative politics who are evaluating the health of democracy in the United States. Jamila Michener is an associate professor in the Department of Government at Cornell University. Her research focuses on poverty, racial inequality, and public policy in the United States. Her recent book, Fragmented Democracy, Medicaid, Federalism, and Unequal Politics with Cambridge University Press, examines how Medicaid, the nation's public health insurance program for people with low income, affects democratic citizenship. It assesses American political life from the vantage points of those who are living in or near poverty, disproportionately Black or Latino, and reliant on a federated government for vital resources. She received her MA and PhD from the University of Chicago and her undergraduate degree from Princeton University. Robert Mickey is an associate professor of political science here at the University of Michigan. His research focuses on US politics and historical perspective. He is interested in American political development, political parties, racial politics, and policy responses to inequality. His book, Paths Out of Dixie, which came out with Princeton in 2015, explores the post-war US South as a set of transitions from authoritarian rule. And finally, Tom Papinski is the Walter F. Lefebvre Professor of Government and Public Policy at Cornell University and a non-resident senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. He has a special interest in Southeast Asia and is a faculty affiliate of the Southeast Asia Program at Cornell, co-founder and member of the executive board of the Southeast Asia Research Group and past president of the American Institute for Indonesian Studies. So, before we turn to our paper presentations today, what I'd like to do is briefly invite uh, Professors Lieberman Papinski, Rob, Tom, uh, to say a few words about the broader project of which these papers we'll be hearing about today are just a part. Rob, you want to say a few words first? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, uh, and thanks for having us and hosting this roundtable. Um, democracy in the United States is in trouble. Thinking clearly and critically about American democracy has never been more important than it is now in this era of seemingly perpetual threat. Recognizing that threat, a group of colleagues in political science, um, including uh, 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 Tom and Suzanne and Jamila and a couple others, uh, joined together a few years ago to form what we call the American Democracy Collaborative. The collaborative comprises scholars who study politics in the United States, including previous crises of democracy, and others who study the conditions that have threatened democracy around the world. Over the past few years, we've organized a number of activities to examine the state of American democracy today. I'll just put in a brief plug. You can read more about the collaborative and its projects at our website, americandemocracycollaborative.org. Today's panel 
as Dan mentioned, comes out of the collaborative's most recent project on democratic vulnerabilities and pathways for reform. This past summer, we convened a diverse and very distinguished group of political scientists, including again, some who study the United States and others who study democratic deterioration abroad. Um, and the group included experts on political institutions, on political behavior, and on social movements, spanning a very wide swath of the discipline. We asked them to explore a series of critical questions. How have longstanding areas of democratic weakness, whether due to institutional arrangements or political processes, made American democracy fragile? In what ways have democratic procedures been jeopardized or weakened in recent years? And finally, and perhaps most important, how can Americans, despite deep polarization, take action to strengthen and protect democracy? Today, what you'll hear is really is only a couple of um, the papers from colleagues who participated in this gathering. But lest you feel deprived, um, I'll put in a plug, as Dan mentioned, for the full series of essays resulting from the Democratic Vulnerabilities Project, which will be published in the January 2022 issue of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. We are uh, extremely grateful to the Academy for their partnership and for their willingness to uh, publish this uh, really terrific group of essays. And now I will turn things over to Tom. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and thanks to Dan and to everybody at the Weiser Center for their support for, this, uh, for, today's, um, for today's event. I'd also like to mention uh, that one of the participants in this project is Dan Slater. And I do want to thank Dan uh, and the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies for hosting today's webinar and for showcasing some of the work uh, that we've done here today. Um, now I want to say that given the Weiser Center's rich tradition of supporting the study of democracy, its emergence and its defense around the world, I'm especially glad for their support and enthusiasm in turning our focus to the state of democracy uh, here in the United States today. Uh, and so our great thanks to Dan for his support and his leadership. Um, and I'll turn the screen back over to him now. Okay, thanks, Tom. And I should also thank Tom Papinski for his expert editorial work on my mess of a paper in its, uh, in its earlier draft. So I should say that as well. So uh, without further ado, let's turn uh, over to the two sets of paper presenters that we have. Um, if uh, Suzanne Mettler and Trevor Brown uh, would take the stage, take the microphone, whatever one does on Zoom, and uh, and get us uh, get us started on the substance of all of this. Sure, I'll take the Zoom stage. I'm sharing my screen now, Thank you, um, and everyone should be able to see my slides. So thanks to Dan um, and the folks at the Weiser Center for having us. Um, Suzanne and I are really excited to be here to share some ongoing work we're doing on uh, the growing rural urban di political divide in American politics and the threats it may or may not have um, for American democracy. Um, so historically, we know that um, in the United States, the United States has been marred by um, a deep uh, sectional cleavage along northern um, and, and southern states. Um, and we also know historically um, that both American political parties have, have historically drawn support from both rural and urban areas. But as Suzanne and, and my analysis show, and our analysis shows, um, starting in the 1990s, um, the North South split has arguably started to give way to um, a new political cleavage, uh, one marked by the rural urban divide. So figure one here shows that um, both rural uh, Northerners and rural Southerners um, have increasingly started to identify as, as Republicans. Um, and figure two here shows that um, increasingly starting in the 1990s, um, rural voters um, have increasingly voted for uh, Republican candidates and urbanites, um, on the other hand, have increasingly aligned with, um, with, dem with Democrats. Um, and this is, a, this is a cleavage that we see in all regions of the country um, and, and um, in most states. Um, and it's one we think is a, a national phenomenon that, that has significant implications both for American politics um, and in the health of American democracy. So um, first I'll just sort of describe uh, sort of what we see as some of the key elements of the rural urban divide and, and what may or may not be sort of driving them. So um, in rural areas, we know that rural areas are disproportionately old, um, something like 
25% uh, of the rural population is age 60 or older um, relative to, to urban areas where, the pop, where about a fifth of the population is 60 years or older. Um, we also know that rural areas are overwhelmingly non-Hispanic white. 80% um, of the rural population is white. Um, we also know in recent decades um, that dramatic economic changes um, have um, um, ravaged um, rural communities. Um, I use left behind here sort of in scare quotes because it's, it's um, used a lot in, in popular punditry, but it is the case that rural areas have struggled economically in recent decades. Um, one estimate holds that between 2001 and 2016, something like 90% of all job growth happened in urban areas. Um, and only 3% in rural areas. We also know that urban areas have been much more successful at transitioning from a, a, an economy rooted in manufacturing uh, to one rooted in services and high technology, whereas rural areas simply have not. Um, we also know that rural non-Hispanic whites, according to our analysis, um, also tend to score higher on measures of racial resentment, which is a popular um, measure for, for anti-Black racism in the United States um, relative to their urban peers. Our estimate puts this at about eight percentage points, uh, depending on what data set we used. Um, this is important in and of itself, but uh, we also know that, that racial resentment tends to translate into, uh, or is highly associated with, with voting for Republicans. Um, so we, we see all of these factors and many others that we're, we're happy to talk about in the Q&A as fertile territory uh, for Republican grievance um, politics. Um, and the data show this out. Um, uh, rural areas have just increasingly voted Republican across the nation. Um, and again, urban areas um, have, have said with Democrats. Um, and now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Suzanne Mettler, who will discuss uh, why we think this, this fissure is, a, is potentially a problem for American democracy. You're muted, Suzanne. Sorry. It's okay. Uh Okay, so um, yeah, thanks to Trevor for, for that um, lead in. So we've been talking so far about the growing political divide of rural people becoming more and more likely to support um, Republicans in elections at all levels. But why would this necessarily um, make this divide harmful to democracy? I wanna emphasize that we are not making an argument that there's something intrinsic to rural areas, rural dwellers that make them more hostile to democracy. And in fact, in uh, American political history, there's been real variation over time. In the late 19th century, um, an agrarian uh, populist movement um, was in, in many ways um, a force for greater democratization in the United States, um, both um, political and economic. Um, and then just until, you know, a couple of of decades ago, um, there was real diversity going on in, um, in rural areas, but uh, that didn't seem hostile to uh, uh, political diversity and it didn't seem hostile to democracy. Um, but there are a few things that have been um, combining in the recent period. So first of all, it's long been the case that American political institutions give extra leverage to people in sparsely populated areas. And of course, they do this through the structuring of the US Senate and the Electoral College, and also through winner take all elections that are based on geographic districts as US House elections are and elections to state legislatures. Um, and this becomes a problem when the election, when, excuse me, the electorate is sorted in a way such that mostly members of one party live in urban areas and members of another party in uh, the more sparsely populated areas, it actually allows those areas as, as polarization grows to um, gain extra leverage and for the party that organizes them to really punch above its weight. So you can become a minority political party getting the support of a minority of Americans, but um, be still managing to run the table in many ways. Um, in addition to that, uh, scholars have long argued that um, politics uh, tends to favor democracy more when citizens have cross-cutting cleavages in terms of their political affiliations and their membership affiliations. 
um, such that they associate with you know, different people through their civic associations and their neighborhoods and workplaces, et cetera. But when all of these things begin to overlap so that you're associating with members of the same um, political party in one after another, it can create um, a, an us versus them politics in, uh, that, that's really problematic. So we're getting away from these catch-all parties in the United States. Uh, seems to be leading to that and to the kind of dynamics that Lily Mason points out in her work, where um, as people sort themselves out politically and socially, like they're part of two separate tribes without overlapping affiliations, that they acquire more negative and stereotypical views of each other. Um, and uh, so we think this is problematic as well. And layered on, on top of that, of growing political polarization, is that those who perceive their own status or privilege to be at risk due to the inclusion of citizens of another racial or ethnic group may be willing to override democracy in order to retain existing hierarchies. And um, we know from Ashley Jardina's work that portion of the white population today perceives itself to be under threat and uh, it, people in rural areas disproportionately um, tend to feel that way. And as um, areas become more diverse, we find that whereas urban whites um, tend to become more um, less racially resentful in their views with growing diversity, rural whites tend to do the opposite. They become more resentful. Um, and then of course there's economic decline, which as Trevor has mentioned, um, can be leading people toward um, a sense of resentment and uh, being uh, prone toward grievance politics. So, um, so the question is, um, you know, do we see this happening in American politics today? Let's go to the next slide. Um, as an indicator of this, we looked at um, the votes that were taken in Congress on the evening after the in January 6th insurrection when Congress reconvened um, and to, um, to, to can certify the electoral college results, 139 Republicans in the House, become known as the Sedition Caucus, voted, they sided with Trump in his claims that the election was fraudulent by um, voting against certifying the uh, results from one or more states. And so we looked at where those particular Republicans are from. So what you can see on this graph for starters is that the Democrats are disproportionately from the least rural or the most urban districts. Um, and the Republicans in combination, we have the, um, them in black for the Sedition Caucus and in red for the non-Sedition Republicans are disproportionately from more rural districts. But within that, there is real variation um, in that um, those from the more rural districts were disproportionately more likely to be members of the Sedition Caucus. Um, and when we delve down into this, um, we find that um, they are from all regions of the country. While 79 of them came from uh, the South, the remaining 60 members um, were uh, elected in states and other regions. Um, in fact, 48 of them came from states that had cast its ele their electoral votes for Joe Biden. Um, and um, some represent states that are routinely elect Democrats at the top of the ticket, including seven from California and four from New York. Um, so uh, we could tell you much more about this, but we look at it as, as one indicator that as the Republican Party becomes um, a more uh, rural dominated party, that it seems to be problematic for, for democracy. And we think that's a big concern in a country where in order to accomplish things in politics, um, you need to build large political coalitions um, in order to do so that, that come from vast parts of the nation. And also given the work that Rob Lieberman and I have done in our, our book, Four Threats, we know that both the emergence of um, partisan, strong partisan polarization and also conflict over who belongs as a member of the political community can, uh, can lead people to try to um, uh, fight for you know, re retaining uh, the power of their party or for their cultural group that has um, been dominant in the past to remain so or to become so again, 
no matter what the costs are for democracy. So uh, we think of these threats as, as really uh, something to be taken seriously. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Thanks so much, Trevor. Thanks so much to, to Suzanne. Um, and so for the next paper that we've got to, uh, to be discussed today, we're going to have um, Jamil Michener and uh, Jake Grumbach when he's able to, to join us. Jamil, are you, uh, you okay to, to kick it off without Jake present yet? Yep. I, I can kick it off. Terrific. I'll, I'll, more power to me because I can say things about Jake. <laughs> we, we, we always love to hear about Jake at WCED, so please feel free. He won't, he's not here to refute. So um, I, what, what I trial, say- is, Trial and absentia. <laughs> yeah. I will say that I don't actually have very many slides. There are only a handful and it's mostly just to distract folks because on the Zoom, if you have no slides, then everyone just has to stare at your face. And so <laughs> the slides are mostly a mirage to give you something to look at besides my face. And so I'm, I'm setting a proper expectations here. Uh, so that you don't expect anything uh, fancy or pretty or what have you. I've saved that for all the teaching I've been doing this week. My, the undergraduates get fancy slides, but everyone else here will have to focus on the substance. So, um, okay, I, I'll just kind of um, transition us into talking about the, the emphasis that Jake and I are bringing uh, to this question of democratic uh, vulnerabilities in, in our paper. And it's perhaps no surprise to folks who know even a little bit about my work or even a little bit about Jake's work that we might take a perspective focused on federalism as one core potential democratic vulnerability um, that in the context of a broader array of concerns about uh, the kind of nature, character and trajectory of US democracy, the veracity of US democracy, the weaknesses of US democracy, the erosion of US democracy, right? We've thought about this for, for a long time, but certainly for at least the last uh, four to five years um, in a lot of different ways. And, and as, as wide ranging as the language is in the context of all of that, those concerns, uh, Jake and I focus on one particular potential institutional source of democratic vulnerability and that is US federalism, right? So the fact that we have, um, and we're not the only ones who have a federated polity, uh, but that we have a distinctively uh, decentralized federated polity, not just where the states and the federal government and even localities are able to do a range of different things, um, but where there's real authority across levels um, and, and there's quite a striking uh, array of decentralization, some of it in, in arenas that have significant implications for the polity uh, writ large and for democracy more broadly. So that's, um, you know, we can think about that in terms of elections. We can think about it in terms of policy arenas that are quite, quite crucial for structuring the contours of the policy, like the polity, um, like on a state level immigration, policy, we can think about it in terms of policy arenas that matter for people's material lives and in that way can structure um, the contours of our democracy, so social policies, and so on and so forth. We can think about it in terms of policing, that's something that uh, many folks have been thinking about forever, but certainly most people have had at some point in the last uh, year plus at the forefront of their mind. You name a critical policy arena, that is connected to, in, in really fundamental ways, uh, the nature and character of US democracy. And it's more than likely uh, that federalism is at the core of it in some way. And so Jake and I take uh, the opportunity in this paper to really draw out some of the relationships that we observe between federalism and political inequality and to think more broadly about what that means for uh, democratic erosion, right? So like I said, it's no surprise that Jake and I would be the ones thinking about this work. I would have put the cover of Jake's book, but I haven't seen it yet, but you should you should certainly pay attention to his book, but also to a, a, a number of other things that Jake has published that help us to think about state politics and policy and federalism. And, and I have some work in a distinct but related veins myself. And so maybe to a hammer, everything is a nail. And because Jake and I think a lot and care a lot about federalism, 
that's what we think about when we think about uh, democratic erosion and vulnerability. But I would argue that it's not just because we're hammers and federalism is the nail, uh, but because this is really a key aspect of the structure of US politics. And so you can't truly assess um, the sort of the, the, the kind of trajectory and the, the kind of current moment of US democracy without contending with and interrogating the role that federalism is playing. So Jake and I take some time to do it, to do that in this paper. I just want to say Jake also tweets about federalism. <laughs> like I said, because he's not here, I can do silly things like put uh, his mm. tweets on on the slides and not not get in trouble for it. Um, not I that actually, I actually just got here. Oh, you just got made. here. Not no, sure. <laughs> your timing. I was hoping you'd come after the slide and you'd never be the wiser. Um, <laughs> but I actually love that. I, in, in a moment of like, I don't know, I was, I was bored one day and wasting time and I Googled Jake Grumbach federalism. And this comes up in the Google images. And I thought this has to be on the slide. Anyway, you get insights and brilliance from Jake um, in many different ways, not just in his papers, but also on his Twitter feed. Uh, to the point, so there's a key argument that Jake and I make in the paper, and I'll, I'll mention it here. I'll start us down the road, and then I will pass the baton to Jake, who can give us uh, elaborations in, in several forms. And our, our key argument is this. Uh, not that federalism is bad in a simple, a simplistic or straightforward way, right? Federalism isn't the kind of thing that you can say it's good for democracy, it's bad for democracy writ large. But as federalism has unfolded historically and continues to unfold contemporarily in the United States, the there are democracy enhancing benefits to federalism. There are ways in, in, in that federalism enables and reinforces and supports uh, what we would think of as some of the positive aspects of democracy. And there are some democratically corrosive aspects of federalism. And I think that most scholars who have spent any time thinking about federalism and even people who have spent time thinking about uh, the kind of um, the role of federalism in our politics might say, oh yeah, okay, this makes sense. Federalism is a mixed bag. But our argument is that the democracy enhancing benefits are structured such that they tend to accrue to economic and political elites, the people who are already advantaged in our political system. While on the other end, the democracy corroding burdens of federalism um, tend to be disproportionately borne by folks who tend to have fewer resources, both politically and economically. So that it's not just that, well, federalism is an institution that can both constrain and enable democracy, but layering um, some nuance onto that is that the ways that federalism tends to constrain democracy and the ways that it tends to enable democracy in the US context are such that that, 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 that it creates pathways for political inequality, right? So that's our core argument. I'm not gonna say much or talk through this much, but I want you to know that we do have a table in the paper where we lay out the actual mechanisms that we think explains, explain that argument that I presented on the previous slide, right? We focus on four mechanisms. One is the mechanism of sort of venue shifting or mobile political resources, the fact that, um, one thing that we think of as a benefit of, 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 of federalism, right? You can shift venues and perhaps what you can't do on the local level, you can do on the state. What you can't do on the state, you can do on the, fed the, the, the federal. And that gives a certain flexibility that we can think of as a democracy enhancing feature of federalism. But it's a feature that, that well-resourced groups like Alex, ALEC, for example, the American Legislative Exchange Council are much better positioned to take advantage of than groups that have fewer resources. And we give specific examples in the paper that show this. And similarly, we talk through these four mechanisms, information asymmetry, exit threat, who can threaten to leave um, the state uh, or leave the locality and use that threat as a source uh, for leverage and political power. And decentralized accountability. We sort of elaborate these four mechanisms and, and provide examples both from the research record and from our own, um, the existing empirical research and our own work, um, ongoing research that we're doing to provide examples to concretize the ways that these mechanisms operate and the ways that they operate ultimately uh, to produce a federated polity um, that means that federalism as it's, it's generally uh, uh, you know, in, in, enacted in the United States tends to benefit
uh, more economically and politically powerful groups. So I'll stop there because I've probably been talking for too long, but, and Jake's here so I can stop and, and sort of give him uh, space to add anything that he might want to add here. Not too long at all, but, uh, but Jake, we'd love to hear from you. Welcome. Glad to you it. Thanks. Again. I can Absolutely. stop sharing if you want us to see your whole face, Jake. Uh, no, this is great. This is perfect. To, how much uh, time should uh, this be? Or, uh, you can take, your, take your time. Take time? Oh, great. Oh. So there's, we, I'll just, we, have, we have a whole another hour, so there's, it, it's fine. Oh, that's great. Well, thanks. It's, an hour it's, great for you. it's an hour for all of us, but, it's, but you definitely have some time to have, you have some that's room, great. Jake. Talk Thank for you. an hour, Jake. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, uh, thanks everybody uh, uh, for the, in the audience for taking the time and uh, 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 great to be with this uh, great group talking about, you know, uh, uh, the precarious state of American democracy. Um, and just continuing on, Jamil, I think Gray have a great uh, summary of our of our take on federalism. And it's been such a outstanding thing. So sort of coming into the study of federalism, there are various research communities within it, various legacies of, of uh, uh, game theoretic rational choice research, historical research, uh, economics of federalism. And then there's a different set of uh, sort of historical institutionalist research, research on, on uh, economic inequality and racial and ethnic politics that have sort of touched on federal institutions in different ways. And then uh, Jamila Michener's book uh, really has uh, been a huge deal in uh, sort of like realigning the scholarship on federalism to think more critically about democracy. And just specifically that book is about uh, Medicaid administration, which is administered by the states and how that affects democratic inclusion. And that was a big, for me, as that happened late in grad school, uh, was a huge deal in, uh, in sort of orienting me to think more critically about how, you know, in creative and different ways to link the considerations I thought, like, why are policy outcomes and socioeconomic outcomes across relevant demographic groups and geography so extreme in the U.S. compared to other uh, wealthy democracies, and then really to think harder about federalism rather than a tradition I was in, and still somewhat in, which is state and local politics, which thinks about, you know, you got 50 separate polities, you have an N of 50, let's look at how public opinion affects outcome, or let's transfer some theory downward to the state or local level, whereas this is really about how federalism itself shapes uh, preferences, political activity, and outcomes, and advantages and disadvantages, various types of actors, and we think this is really important, especially in the contemporary moment of American politics, and that's in part because American federalism is not only decentralized the way Jamila said, there's less inter-regional redistribution the way German federalism has and every other federal system. But really crucially, the U.S. puts democratic institutions, election administration, legislative districting, and police powers, criminalization of speech and protest and assembly, right, and protection of journalists' sources, right, and speech. All of these things are state-level constitutional powers, and that's very unique, right? And I think in... Uh, in general, that leaves American democracy in an age of hyper-national polarized and, uh, and organized parties in this technological moment where capital and political resources can move wherever to finance a January 6th rally, let's all, let's all go, and so forth, that that actually leaves American democracy extremely precarious. So just continuing on these mechanisms, though, in this paper, we're trying to generalize some mechanisms that have been mentioned by people as di different as, you know, Schatz Snyder to, you know, Lisa Miller to uh, uh, scholars of uh, uh, all sorts of scholars of racial and ethnic politics, especially at the, in legislative politics and um, descriptive representation. And these things where like a lot of different scholars have talked about this in different ways. And we're trying to bring together these theories. So one of which is this asymmetry and ability to move your political resources. If you're a if you're a set of workers at like a meatpacking plant in Arkansas and COVID hits, like, can you be like, oh, we're, let's move our political resources to this other, like this political opportunity in this other legislature, like that's ridiculous, right? But if you're a large firm or a wealthy individual, you really can move information, lobbying resources, money itself through contributions, uh, uh, sort of PR campaigns, you can move those around much uh, more clearly, you can move and, uh, number three on our list is 
the exit threat itself and its uh, and the way it enhances structural power, the implicit threat. We saw this, for example, when California's legislature threatened to pass a bill to make Uber and Lyft drivers and DoorDash people into formal employees, right? Then Lyft and Uber just said, all right, like, we're out, you know, or Tesla does a great bidding war to race to the bottom bidding war. Where are we going to put our factory? Who, which state will give us the biggest tax breaks to locate? Whereas ordinary people have their families and communities deeply geographically embedded. Social movements, like, you know, if you're a Black Lives Matter activist somewhere, or climate act, like, and you're some young, young person who's deeply committed to social change, like, you're not going to, it's really hard to move to the most advantageous political, geopolitical area, right? That's not a thing that's as easy to do or as just an ordinary voter, right? You're deeply tied to your community. You have a tough time exiting because housing caught you, your social relations are geographic and housing is really prohibitive. And you move, again, all this big sort language we heard about people moving to, you know, communities with all Democrats and all Republicans and Bobo's in paradise sorting here. And it actually turns out that people sort based on like their own economic opportunities and their social connections. And those things are not advantageous for ordinary people to be able to be like, to threaten to exit a jurisdiction to get more out of government that they want compared to concentrated interests. Um, information asymmetry is huge. And we think increasingly big deal in democratic inequality through federalism, especially with the decline of state and local journalism and the rise of, for example, the great research on Sinclair Media from uh, Greg Martin and others, uh, and I think uh, Josh McCrane, buying up local TV stations, making their coverage more right-wing and more nationally oriented, and making it harder for ordinary people to monitor what their state and local representatives are doing, right? And opening up opportunities for concentrated interests, again, to seek advantages. Um, decentralized accountability, which I think is like the story of COVID, how Andrew Cuomo was riding high until, you know, it became very clear that he was a frequent sexual harasser, but his COVID performance was quite poor. And yet he was the darling of cable, you know, sort of moderate and liberal cable TV because in a multi-tiered system like the US where there's a just ridiculous number of elected offices at three tiers of government, where it's really hard to know who's responsible for my train being late, who's responsible for this pollution in the water, who's responsible for my lack of you know, financial capital and like my eviction and all of these things and health insurance, who knows, but it provides new opportunities for entrepreneurial politicians and political elites to say, like, it's them, like, the, especially when they're from the out party and Cuomo had that to a T. He was brilliant at it. And it meant accountability was neither centralized at the national governmental level, where the Republicans had unified control when this began, nor in states. So nobody is responsible. Everybody's responsible, so nobody's responsible. And that, that decentralized accountability really reduces governmental performance, creates a tremendous amount of shirking, and uh, it means that uh, overall problems don't get solved, but particularly not national problems. Um, so all of those are things that produce uh, real problems for our traditional you know, ideas of federalism that come from the Federalist Papers and Louis Louis Brandeis and uh, game theorists from the mid late mid late twentieth century who formalized theories of the threat of exit and how that reduces rent extractions from government and things like that and T boot models and things like when you look at this from this other angle with a critical democracy and inequality focus regardless of your methodological background like I love that Jamila and I bring different sort of methodological and research traditions but with this substantive and theoretical interest you see this picture of federalism uh, sort of become more clear. Um, yeah, uh, I'd love to uh, stop there. Thanks very much. Fantastic. And I feel like the gain of Bobo's in paradise reference in a WCD panel is definitely a high point in, uh, in, in my tenure here to, to, to be sure. I did not, never expected to hear, to hear that, that David Brooks echoed in such, such, such elegant fashion. Um, so what we're going to do next. Um, so Rob Mickey, who is another uh, project participant on this broader project has, has very graciously agreed to offer 
um, some responses to the two papers that we've uh, that we've heard uh, before we open up to the audience and to, to Q and A. And I should say, in terms of Q and A, uh, if anybody would like to ask a question, there is a Q and A uh, button at the bottom of the uh, of the screen. And if you feel free to start asking your questions now, and we should have plenty of time at the end to uh, for those to be curated and to deliver those to to our panelists. So feel free to fire away on Q and A. And uh, and Rob Mickey, if you want to give us some some reactions to these two really fantastic papers, that'd be great. Great, thank you. Thanks for letting me take part. Um, can y'all hear me okay? Okay. Um, so about five minutes ish. Sure, sure. Okay. As, um, you will. As you will. Okay, thanks. Um, so first on the Brown Medler, Medler Brown paper, I thought this was great and really overdue, um, both looking at the rural urban divide, but also um, it's the first work I've seen that really thinks hard about this divide in terms of threats to democracy. So um, I hope it's the first and um, I mean, I hope it's not the last such paper. I hope it uh, it inspires a lot more work like this. I really appreciate the look at the your look at the congressional behavior of people based on different kinds of districts and degree of rurality. Um, a, a couple of questions. I, and I know you covered this in your paper and you spoke about it today. But I'd like to hear a little bit more about why you don't just talk about rural whites. Um, you didn't show, for example, that there were differences between rural and non-rural non-whites. Um, uh, you make a good point that the difference between rural and non-rural whites with respect to racial resentment isn't massive. I'm also, I guess I'm wondering what you might find if you also looked at um measures of straight racial animus or investments in white identity um on the a couple questions about the causes um you said today and in the paper which i like that um you're not making any assumptions about there being some kind of authoritarian essence to um uh to rural folks you know akin to like a lips it on working class authoritarianism or something but you do talk a little bit about distinct ways of looking at the world so i was wondering if you could just flesh out a bit what you mean there um oh you have a nice discussion of causes you know from from economic changes um and some others all the causes though were structural i was just wondering um since you're describing a big shift in party attachment, um, did any of this come about through party building, um, through de party decay or hollowing out on the Democratic side? Um, that, that seems worthy of looking at. On the consequences front, just one question here. Um, like I said, I was very glad you looked closely at the Sedition Caucus, but um, if you were to extend this and look at how um rural members of congress vote to deliver more benefits for their people you know one of the um kind of political economic reasons for the anger and resentment was this feeling or impulse that others are getting more um how do how do these members of congress vote to actually deliver more i'm guessing that the republicans don't um and I think that heightens the puzzle for materialists like me, and also for like you a little bit, um, why, why this support continues, right? Um, if they're really upset about lack of benefits and the people they shower votes upon don't offer any, um, how do we think about that? Um, on the Mishner Grumbach paper, um, as, a, as someone who's spent a lot of time wrestling with federalism, I thought this was fascinating. Um, great to bring this focus on political inequality to federalism and even better, and I hope people read this paper, it's great to develop these four key mechanisms with actually using our existing toolkit. I feel like a lot of academics need to brand themselves with eight other phrases that we now need to learn and memorize, which is tough in your old age, my old age. So. I thought it was great how you draw on, on um, these mechanisms that are um, 
that are not just completely understandable, at least to researchers, but are also um, really compelling and persuasive. I thought this was really novel work. Uh, a few questions for you all, and you kind of get to this at the end of your paper, but I'm wondering what's present era about this um, in terms of the impact of these channels or these mechanisms on growing political inequality. You know, as you all know well, and have taught me a lot, political inequality is also growing for a lot of other reasons. So both I wonder about the relative import of federalism, but I'm also wondering is federalism newly awful? Is it just exacerbating political inequality a bit more than it used to? Um, I kind of feel like this paper is a paper in what's especially wrong with federalism at the current moment. Um, you know, your argument about information asymmetry, and you know this, I'm just telling the audience this, you know this, but the argument rests a lot on the nationalization of politics, right? Um, I mean, you can whinge about Sinclair and state journalism, and I, I, I guess I agree with you on that. But the core of this information asymmetry is Americans not putting much effort into noticing state and local politics um, like they do national politics, right? Um, they're not they're not trying to, or they're seeming like they're not trying to trace um, culpability as with Cuomo. So. Um, I guess I'm just wondering about whether this is, again, whether this information asymmetry problem is a problem of federalism or if it's a problem of federalism amidst this nationalization. Um, I think this elite cross-state coordination effort um, across the country, investing in states as ALEC and AFP, Americans for Prosperity, and other groups do, um, they're also kind of exploiting or riding this wave of nationalization as well. Um, I think it'd be great if you could today, if you said a little bit more about preemption, which is which you did talk about, but which is um, really important and people are finally um, noticing a bit more. And then finally, um, I like that your paper is such a de departure from the rest of us um, worrying about backsliding and an actual change to free and fair elections, civil rights and civil liberties and so on. But I was wondering if you could actually talk about the degree, if any, to which this rising political inequality actually impinges on things like backsliding, not merely, and I don't mean merely, but not merely quality of democracy. Um, just to close up, I'd actually, given that we have the time, I'd encourage the two sets of authors to reflect on connections across each other's papers. Um, I was wondering who federalism advantages um, in rural states, which mechanisms are maybe more or less important in rural areas. And yeah, and what Suzanne and Trevor thought about their rural Americans in light of Jamila and Jake's work. Uh, sorry for going on so long. Oh, that's great, Rob, terrific. Um... And so we're uh, still not having any, uh, or we're just just beginning to get some some questions and answers, or some, some questions, excuse me, rolling in. Um, do any of the uh, any of the authors like to to take a minute and respond to any of the anything that the Rob put on the table? Trevor, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll open it up and then pass to to Suzanne if that's okay to Jamila and Jake. Um, so I answer a couple of the questions on race. Why look at non-Hispanic whites? Um, so Rob, thanks for the generous feedback um, and, and it's really generative. Um, so this is part of a broader project. Um, so this is not as, as you sort of hinted at the end all of, of the project. Um, why well, look at non-Hispanic whites um, right now in, in this part of the project? Um, well, that's largely where we see most of the polarization. Um, now that sorry, said- Sorry, um, let me just interrupt. Sorry, I actually meant um, why talk about this as a, um, issue in rural America and not as a problem in white rural America. That's what I was Oh, a framing question. Yeah. Yeah, great question. We should re reframe, reframe that then. Um, but in, in terms of, of examining um, um, non-whites, yes, that is it's like, again, on the, the docket, 11% um, of rural um, counties um, are majority minority. 
Um, and an open question for us is what sort of pol politics um, uh, uh, racial minorities um, in majority white communities also uh, feel all, or, or experience. I'll also answer the question uh, you sort of pose on um, sort of, um, or I'll, I'll, I'll get at one of the questions you posed on sort of the relationship between Congress and benefits. One paradox that, that Suzanne and I have found um, through this research and, and ongoing research is um, that rural communities, um, while they disproportionately vote Republican, they also disproportionately rely on federal social transfers. Um, so an open puzzle for us and an open puzzle, I think, for, for the broader research community is, is, is the sort of inverse relationship between um, rural communities relying heavily on federal transfers and, and also uh, voting for a party that is frankly hell bent on tearing those uh, benefits um, down. Uh, but I'll kick it to Suzanne, uh, who likely has thoughts on the others. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, there are um, there are so many paradoxes in, in looking at this topic, um, and you know, one of them, Trevor was was just highlighting. Um, I think that you know the way people are voting now in rural areas, it's with a party that's very anti-government in its rhetoric and its policy positions, and yet we find consistently that um, there is higher use of federal social transfers in rural counties and that it's associated with voting for Republicans. Um, and so, I mean, if the paradoxical thing is that rural people right now do have a strong sense of resentment and they feel like they have less power than other Americans. And yet, in fact, they actually have outsized power. Um, so, you know, that's a, a puzzle of how these things can go together. Um, we are you know, still in the early stages of this larger project, but where we really want to move to is trying to understand developments over time and what changing circumstances led to others and so on. We kind of expect that there's a chain of events um, from the 1990s into the early 2000s into the present um, that, that we want to try to trace out. And one of the things we're going to be doing, and in response to Rob's question about what about party building and, and what's happened, we're very curious about that because, um, you know, as recently as the 1980s and 1990s, um, lots of Democrats won in, um, in rural areas um, and, you know, states that are disproportionately rural um, still had at that point democratic controlled legislatures and, and a fair amount of party competition, whereas Republicans have become very dominant. And then there are many states, you know, in the rural, more rural states in the South and Midwest that over that time period shifted from uh, occasionally electing uh, uh, Democrats to the US Senate and several to the House and, and being up for grabs in presidential elections to now voting more solidly for Republicans across the board. Um, and so what's happened to the Democratic Party in those places? Um, you know, there are still um, more people in rural areas who will say they're, they are Democrats than there are Republicans in urban areas. Um, but those areas have gone from being more politically competitive to being less so. And so we are going to, we're, we're gearing up to be doing interviews with um, party officials in and former party officials in various states. So, so that's where, where we're headed. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of like the connection between our paper and Jake and Jamila's, um, I think I, what I would want to look at is really these historical developmental questions of why have things changed over time? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't need at all to be convinced that federalism is, is problematic for democracy and inequality. And so I looked at that in the New Deal period. Um, but then as we moved forward in the 20th century, it seemed that that federalism was becoming less problematic for inequality and democracy. But now we've come into a period where it's become more so again. Um, and I think that trying to figure out that variation um, and uh, is, is important and where um, 
And you know, similarly, the question I'm posing for Trevor and myself is to look at why the role of rural people in our politics has changed over time and what difference that makes. Yeah, I'm really, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by that, Suzanne, because the like talking about this in terms of chains of events and historical development, I think is a really useful angle to take as opposed to, or kind of there's this tension point, which we've talked about in the project before about thinking in terms of the language of threats, the language of vulnerabilities, you know, vulnerabilities are something that are lasting. So then why does a vulnerability suddenly, you know, become an exposed vulnerability, if you will? Um, you know, do we think about the current American moment as one where there's emerging threats, one where these are sort of lasting vulnerabilities that are, that are finally, you know, actually you know, coming home to roost? Or is it something that's something kind of in between where it's really about certain processes interlocking American political development, you know, that kind of story as well. So I think kind of struggling through the different temporalities here is going to be really, really interesting and important for the, for, for the project. And just the way you, you spoke about it, I thought was really promising in that way. Um, Jake yeah. and Jamila, do you guys want to, uh, to, to weigh in at all on the questions or? If, if I might chime in Please. on this point specifically, this last Please. point around um, the, uh, you know, the, the notion that there are these enduring vulnerabilities, right, but that at particular points in, in time, they are heightened, right, and they're heightened for well, the question is what reasons, right? And that's the question that that Suzanne just gestured towards. Um, and it's the one that that Rob was essentially asking when he said, well, what's present era about these mechanisms? Like what's going on now that's different from what's just always there? And I think that, um, you know, there's a kind of undercurrent, a consistent undercurrent across history of some of the kind of the, the ways that federalism, the potential that federalism has um, uh, to be democratically corrosive, and that's certainly there. But in the ways that Suzanne just pointed out, there have been times when that seems to come to the fore in um, a per particularly sharp relief and other times not so much, and now we're back to one of those times. I think, you know, the two things that I would say are distinct about this period, it doesn't mean it explains earlier periods when federalism also seemed to be a more striking democratic vulnerability. It's certainly the case that across different periods, the vulnerability can be heightened for different reasons, right? But certainly I think in this period, some of the explanation for that heightened, for federalism um, as a vulnerability in a heightened way is twofold. And, and they're the two things that, 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 that we mentioned in the paper and that Rob mentioned in his comments. And one is the kind of scale and scope of, of nationalization of politics that we're seeing now. And the other is that happening in the context of, uh, of deep partisan polarization, right? Um, and I think that those things together combined with a third thing, which is, um, you know, a, a sort, of, sort of unprecedented levels of economic inequality. So I think economic inequality, polarization and nationalization are coming together to make federalism especially dangerous. Now sort of mapping out how and why those things specifically, how they interact, intersect with each other, um, how they look different now than they have in the past, like, Get, uh, fully articulating that is probably an entirely a, an entire additional paper, <laughs> but I will say because you know we've been talking about it that starts to get us at some of like what's distinct in the present moment, what combinations of things exist now that haven't always existed in the combination to the extent that they do now that explain why federalism is emerging in new ways as a potential vulnerability, and, and those are the three things that I would say um, are, are really most striking. Um, there's so much more, but maybe I'll stop there so that Jake can chime in if he has anything. And then there's some great questions, so I'll go try to go quick. But uh, I think, yeah, this is really uh, crucial stuff. And like, Rob, your feedback on both like bleeds into each is really helpful here. And one thing I want to say is that so like we shouldn't understate the problems of federalism uh, historically. So it certainly delayed the end of slavery. It delayed the end of Jim Crow. Um, that it's a potential that a unitary system wouldn't have had slavery in the, in the beginning with the preference structure of elites in the late uh, 18th century. Like this is very clear stuff when the North has more anti-slavery votes in the aggregate than the South and these things don't change. It's because of this institutional structure, the Senate of course as well and judicial, but really think about the states have been the main 
attack like in this op-ed i just wrote with eric schickler it like eric helped me think through this and really it was eric's thing but like when you think about it the main attack you know threats of democracy arise from state governments to some extent uh, uh explicitly promoted by the supreme court presidents have been mixed and then congress either does no collective action or it stops it like congress doesn't seem to actively get collective action towards backsliding to happen um, so that seems to be a, a very clear historical pattern throughout American history. But then now it's just, uh, it's really clear that, I mean, Suzanne mentioned, it's just a great point. The long New Deal period through the civil rights period was, uh, there were so many it, uh, ways that the states as an institutional level became less relevant in terms of policy and redistribution, the rise of floors for uh, the safety net, the rise of the end of Jim Crow, this is like so clear. And now we're back to a period of the devolution of power informally and formally since the 1970s, especially. And now we see huge variation in democratic performance. And the last thing I'll say is uh, Rob has taught me about analogies to Jim Crow now. And, you know, the new Jim Crow was Michelle Alexander talking about mass incarceration. And there are relationships between mass incarceration and Jim Crow and, you know, slave catching as a, a, a development of American policing and things. And, uh, but there's, uh, then when we think of now, Joe Biden in speeches mentions Jim Crow when he's talking about contemporary voter suppression. Um, but really thinking about the differences between Jim Crow and now, the similarities are that clearly there's coalitional opposition to multiracial democracy, that's Jim Crow 101. And then uh, there is uh, the use of like race neutral language to stop uh, often disproportionately black people from voting in, you know, and that matters, urban rural divides matter there where uh, uh, that's a huge deal um, in especially these states that have a conservative white rural population and an urban center and very equal uh, overall legislative seats from Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, these are clear examples of that polarization between the cities and rural areas on racial dimensions, especially. But then the differences of, from Jim Crow is that Rob has helped me think through that Jim Crow is about battles over public goods, land redistribution and things within communities, desegregation of schools within community, whether like black people are going to this particular white school, whereas now this is a national coalition that sees the country slipping away so we have to stop democracy at from a all hands on deck national coalition battle between it's like the libs and the immigrants said, you know, it's the main story of like, you know, coalition of like on politically entrepreneurial, like I, I for lack of a better word, you know, there's anti-Semitic conspiracies baked into it's an entire structure of society slipping away. And it's a national battle over the nation, whereas Jim Crow was not particularly that. Despite the similarities, this is why federalism interacts differently and the vulnerabilities of democracy interact at a different level where it's national political forces being played out through subnational political institutions in a way that's different than the past. Wonderful. Thank you all for those responses. Um, I want to start taking some uh, some of the questions from the audience that we're getting rolling in. So, so one from Paige Kelly, who is asking about how the authors of both of these papers think about changing state local dynamics as driving contemporary political polarization. The conversation seems to focus on federal state relations, but doesn't not so much on how shifts between subnational governments might influence the contemporary moment. And I would just sort of add to that, or this might be part of what Paige has in mind, um, the question of, of, of cities. Right. I mean, a lot of our questions here are on rural areas, but it seems to me that the politics of, you know, Atlanta loomed very, very large in the last election, Detroit loomed very, very large in the conflicts uh, here in Michigan. Right. So the question of what these these outsized, you know, the lot, particularly very, very large cities in these purple states in particular, like to what extent that kind of relations between, um, you know, other parts of the state and these and these big urban centers um, might be playing in all of this. Um, Jamil, yeah. I think you unmuted first. You want to go? Yeah, yeah. I want to chime in here because it brings me to Rob's question on preemption, I think, and helps to tap into some of the things that came up in the paper that we didn't uh, bring up here um, in the first instance, but I think are really important. So our approach to federalism in the paper is, is what we call a federalism all the way down. So it's not just about what's happening between the federal government and the states. It's also what's happening between the states and localities and the federal government and localities, right? All of those different levels. And 
part of the argument that we make is that that the relationship, for example, between states and localities through institutions like like preemption, which are institutions that only can only exist in a federated context to the extent that they do in the U.S. Um, you know, that there are ways that that bakes in the kinds of political inequality that we're talking about and changes the kind of political possibilities on a local level, right? So when, for example, we use examples in the paper from uh, the realm of housing. And so when, for example, state legislatures say, you can't have rent control or you can't ban uh, certain forms of housing discrimination, or you can't have certain forms of inclusionary zoning, um, it's not just that that means that localities can't do such and such thing. It means that um, that local groups like, you know, grassroots organizations, political organizations, people who would otherwise be trying to build power in those communities to work towards those goals, have those goals removed from the table altogether. And that means they either need to reorient politically, often towards like much less transformative goals. Um, that are much more localized and much less likely to change the scope of politics across the state and certainly across the nation. Or sometimes it means that they lose political steam altogether um, because they can't pursue the things that are truly going to change the lives of the people on the ground who they're trying to build power with and for. So that's just one example, but I think preemption is a particularly strong example of how state local dynamics can constrain the political context for um, particularly for groups that don't have a ton of resources, grassroots groups, right? Um, whereas we've seen on the other hand, um, economic, powerful economic elites use preemption as a tool to prevent things from happening in states that they don't wanna happen, right? Rent control is a perfect example of that. It's apartment associations and property managers and capital landowners um, who say, we, we don't wanna fight each locality, each city, we, we don't want to fight Austin and then, you know, um, Houston and so on and so forth in each place trying to advance rent control. Let's just make it so that Texas doesn't have, says no rent control anywhere. So elite economic interests can use preemption to, to save them political time um, and to, they can concentrate their political resources in the place that makes the most sense for them. And at the same time, that's going to make a, a, a create a really challenging political environment for other kinds of non-elite interests. And so there's that continuing dynamic. And in a context of nationalization and negative polarization, you're going to see tools like that being used more and more. So there's that, what about this present moment makes that dynamic even more challenging, right? Just a couple of thoughts. I'll stop there. Terrific, terrific. I could jump in here. Yeah, um, this is a great question. And it's a, a question that as we get into studying specific states and doing interviews with people, we're going to be really curious to learn about this. But what I could say that we're learning already when we look at the what the rural urban political divide looks like within states, as Trevor mentioned earlier, it's grown in almost all states. Um, and I think that, um, you know, even in states that we think of as very blue states, um, there are a lot of rural people there who get really angry these days about um, what's happening in terms of state government. For example, here in, in New York State, um, for um, the longest time after the uh, passage of the, the SAFE Act, which was a strong gun control uh, law that, that um, Cuomo had signed in the law several years ago. I'd be out of my bike riding through rural areas and seeing all of these signs, you know, against angry about the SAFE Act, repeal the SAFE Act. Um, and so I think that you get different kinds of dynamics, you know, in individual states. And uh, I am curious about the question of, you know, to what extent is nationalization the force here? And to what extent are there all of these, you know, 50 state dynamics that are, it's very striking when we look at the regional growth of the rural urban divide. Like a lot of people assume, oh, it must just be because the South switched from being Democrat to Republican. It's not, every state has had, a, or every region of the country and most states have had a big shift in this direction. And we've actually got a good couple of questions here on the rural uh, on the rural dimension, which I want to kind of put together a little bit here as we maybe stick with this theme. Um, so we have one question from Adam Casey. He's one of our postdocs here at, here at WCED. And he's curious about how rural voting changed from 2016 to 2020. Um, 
do we think the new Trump voters in 2020 were overwhelmingly rural? And do rural non-white voters vote more similarly to their rural white counterparts or urban non-white counterparts? This course gets back to, to Rob's initial question about to what degree this is a story of, of rural as opposed to rural, rural white America. Um, and also, I mean, I was sort of thinking during the presentation about the some of the data we saw from rural Texas, so in Latino votes, so particularly in the borderlands. So to what degree, like how do we understand the Trump performing better in 2020 than 2016 among among you know rural Latinos, especially in a place like a place like Texas? And then we have a, another question on the on the rural, which I think is really important here from a gentleman named Richard, who brings Christianity into the conversation and religion. In. And I don't think uh, I don't think religion has come up uh, at any time here. And uh, Richard notes that you know, he thinks that the shifting the political stance of evangelical Christianity might go a long way toward explaining what's happened to rural votes. Richard says he attended a small congregation during the 68 and 72 elections, and the elections were basically not mentioned. So to what degree do we think that um, that rural churches might be helping mobilize for and making a case for, for Trump in 2016 and 2020? Such good questions. Yeah. I can take the, the first two. So, so on the the difference between white voters in 2016 and 2020, um, there, there was a marginal increase in, in rural whites increasingly voting vote Republican. But again, like we would stress that this, that we think this is a long-term trend that, that predates Trump. Um, on the second question, which is a great one on, on, um, on non-whites, um, my question, my answer would be twofold. Um, one, it, it depends. There, there are likely distinct state and regional dynamics. Um, the, the, the second part of my answer is most of the data we've looked at is national. Um, and nationally, um, on aggregate, on average, um, rurality does not um, um, increase the likelihood that, that um, non-white folks vote Republican. Um, to, to answer those two questions. And then I think Suzanne wants to, to answer the, the one on evangelicalism. Yeah, and uh, we could just say a little bit more about that too. As I um, heard that question, I think that there's a question about do um, do non-Hispanic whites vote differently if they live in rural and urban areas? And um, we do have another paper where we we look at that extensively, and we find in um, in some ways they vote the same, and in other ways they vote differently. Um, and uh, so there, there are some really interesting patterns that emerge. Um, so um, so more, more on that another day. But, um, but the question about churches and religion is really interesting. In that paper, we actually look at the role of some different kinds of organizations. Um, and evangelical organizations are more prevalent as a, um, in relation to the population in rural areas. Um, and so they do seem to be an important force in um, mobilizing people and getting out the vote in rural areas um, in particular. Trevor, anything else to, that you want to add there? I love that. And I, I'm so glad, like I was, if I, if Suzanne wasn't going to jump in on the organizations point, which she was, I was like, we have Suzanne Mettler on the panel like this, she will take this one, but that's crucial. I just think uh, on that point, thinking about the change in civil society organizations is so crucial. So we talk a lot about the education gap in voter behavior now and like individual level causal processes. But like, I think the real, real thing is the right, the fact that uh, in rural, the rural U.S. in general now, the remaining civil society organizations that are engaged in politics are mega churches, Evangelical mega churches, some NRA chapters, and to some extent, like Americans for Prosperity chapters. Whereas before, there were um, not as much in rural areas, but there were labor unions. There were uh, university towns that had uh, sort of civil society organizations. There were churches that were more progressive and not aligned with sort of reactionary movements. These are very big changes when we think about where someone gets their political orientation and socialization. Um, and, you know, they think of like Scotch Pole and Gans talk a lot about decline of, you know, less overtly political, but just like hunting groups are now affiliated with the NRA, whereas they used to be more outdoorsy and care about like the environment. You could be a Sierra Club member out there and things and be like an outdoorsman white guy. And now it's not, now it's not that case. Um, and then on the point about uh, uh, the other point on a uh, 
um, uh, uh, just like, uh, uh, I mean, on a number of dimensions here is that, uh, actually, never mind, sorry, sorry, but uh, crucial decline of civil society organization. Great. And I would just say, I mean, I'm going to not necessarily push back against this, but maybe just push this in a different direction a little bit, which is, so organizations, absolutely, right? When we think about religion, we think about mobilization, I mean, and we're social scientists, so we see organizations, we get excited, we, we think about the, the really big factor, right? But I want to get everyone thinking a little bit about ideas, right? And so this is prompted a bit by the question that, that Jamie asks in the, in, in the Q&A and asking about, like, what's the role of, I, of, of particular ideas, certain myths that we have, conservative ideas, conservative myths, liberal ideas, liberal myths, and what role they that these might play in like the current political moment in, in, in the United States as well, and to, to what degree you know our ideas playing in here as well, and not only the way that they get that they get organized is that um, something that we should be thinking about? Is this a, an ideological story as well? Just really, really quick. Um, I, I think it's still organizational, and it's super cliche now, but the quantitative evidence is just so clear. But the rise of Fox News just can't be understated. Like. I think it's it's much more powerful than any theory we have of social media and echo chambers and misinformation and Cambridge Analytica and Russian Moldova, you know, like Ukrainian memes and stuff in 2016. Like it's just that simple. Well, okay, so good. So even if we treat that as a variable, right? But it could it could work through different mechanisms, right? And so one way this, I mean, part of what what is being you know going over Fox or MSNBC or any other is ideas and certain ideas about about the American nation, about the future, about about job loss, you know, about the way that you know people are kind of imagining these these outcomes, this you know sense of sense of decline, you know, and these and these grievances over over perceived decline. Um, you know, we didn't, you know, really, you know, talk here much about, I think, another really, really big question here on the policing issue, right, and, and polarization over, on the one hand, Black Lives Matter, and, I mean, one of the biggest social movements we've ever seen in the United States, and on the other hand, you know, a, a president who was clearly very, very pro-policing, and, you know, this is, again, something that was, at least potentially, could speak across racial and ethnic groups, could speak across the urban-rural divide, so these are, at some level, th th these are ideas, Right, um, or at least might be worth thinking about them as I, I say. Interests, organizations, yes, but maybe there's something to maybe the, the discussion could be enriched by thinking in terms of of the ideas that are being projected as well. Jamil, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I wanted to say so. I appreciate this uh, this in intervention and the prompting to sort of think about the ideational develop, uh, dimensions here, right? And while my inclination is to be more uh, oriented towards grounding. Um, my explanations in sort of institutions and more sort of materialist uh, perspectives. I do think ideas are important. And I, and I also think, and I guess what I would say is that, well, I primarily think that there actually isn't some kind of a choice between is it institutions, is it organizations, and is it, is it ideas, right? In fact, um, ideas operate through institutions. Unless ideas... Um, flow through institutions and, 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 and institutional mechanisms, channel them in particular ways and also affect them in certain ways. We don't see the kinds of outcomes that we do. So, you know, on the one hand, I, it, it is ideas that sort of often are justifying the kinds of institutional arrangements that we're helping to create a sort of justification, a rationale and a diffuse, you know, popular support for the kinds of institutional arrangements that many of us have been talking about um, on this panel, right? There's a kind of like mythos of, of the rural, right? And that's like a racialized mythos of the rural. And, and, you know, in that question that Paige Kelly asked, many of the things mentioned there are connected with, you know, really, um, you know, both, both racialized and classed and gendered um, and religious sets of ideas that are operating through um, the different kinds of institutions that we've talked about, right? Um, and so ideas and institutions are really um, integrated and intertwined in ways that make it difficult to say like, no, ideas don't matter. Of course they do, you know, but how do those ideas come to have material life, to matter in people's material lives? And really that's through institutions. And sometimes the ideas are bubbling up, um, you know, from the ground. And in and, 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 and that way, we might think that as they're channeled through institutions, there's something really democratic about that. 
And in other ways, the pro and often the process is, is quite the opposite. One of the things that struck me when I talked to actual people about how what they think about uh, variation, for example, in social policy benefits across states is that there's almost no person that I talk to who's either receiving these benefits or has received these benefits that say, oh, I think it makes perfect sense that what I get changes when I move from New York to New Jersey or from Florida to North Carolina. I think that's really, it's really important that that arbitrary, uh, you know, um, inequality is built into the system. That's nobody's idea. <laughs> that's not a good idea to, to hardly anyone on an experiential level on the ground. But, but it's, it stems from a set of institutions that of course we're committed to um, and that has real material implications. Those institutions can take other ideas like the power of the, the, lo the local, the power of police on a local level or what have you um, and amplify them and, and channel them in particular ways. But so this is, I guess all of this is to say, there's a really complex, you know, intertwined relationship by, between ideas and institutions that I think we're always grappling with as scholars and, and as denizens, right? So I appreciate you prompting us in that direction. And also it's really hard. And now you see, ladies and gentlemen, what happens when you push a political scientist on how much institutions matter. This is what you get. This is the kind of response you're, li you're, you're liable to get because because they do matter a lot. So I actually want to kind of wrap up with one final final question. Um, both, you know, also as a way of channeling the the um, the, the organizers of the projects. I know one thing that Suzanne and and Rob and Tom are very interested in is is questions of reform and questions of possible you know ways out here, right? And we have this very a very succinctly stated question from, from Els Neuenheisen asking, you know, what is your hope for the future? How can change take place? So I think I would just sort of urge everyone to take a moment and think about, do we feel like there are possibilities for reform that are worth, or, or that you've explored in your paper? How like maybe the, at least the roughest edges on these problems might be smoothed out a bit? What, what are some thoughts on, on change, improvement, what we do about these things? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, one thing, the ideational politics do matter at this point. I think there actually is for a large number of coalitions or groups, political groups within American politics, they don't are not aware of these disadvantageous elements of federalism, and they don't take opportunities to centralize policymaking in ways that would provide positive feed, policy feedback for them. Um, in the future. So I actually think this is an area where ideas could matter and progressive groups and diffuse interests and uh, immigrant rights groups, civil rights groups often focus at the state and local level because they're out of power nationally. It seems tractable, but that shouldn't be mistaken. Taking what you can get uh, shouldn't be mistaken for like how would an alternate institutional structure advantage or disadvantage different groups. So I actually do think there's a move there. And the first thing given just the threat of democracy is National, there just needs to be national protection of electoral and other democratic institutions in a more robust way. Um, this is becoming very clear and states are innovating new ways to threaten electoral and other forms of democracy. And it's, that is pretty crucial. Absolutely great. Suzanne? Um, yeah, of course, this is the toughest question to answer about where do we go from here. Um, but I am struck by how when we look at um, the views of rural versus urban people, there's real variation in terms of um, on what topics they see things differently and what topics they don't. And so I think that at this point, it's absolutely crucial for us as a nation to try to focus on the places where there's not that much difference. Um, Trevor and I just recently were, were looking at some public opinion polling where you look at feeling thermometers by rural and urban non-Hispanic whites, and there are some dramatic differences in views. But when it comes to like how both think about big business and how both think about labor unions, there's either no difference or almost no difference at all, which is really striking. Um, you know, um, when you ask about Black Lives Matter, the difference is a huge gulf. But um, I think it's crucial uh, to find that common ground. And you know, when um, if we're looking at issues like healthcare, uh, education, spending, um, and various social policies, there's not so much of a difference. And so um, 
it's really essential to, to try to be um, establishing some bridges and, you know, and, and to be realistic about it. I mean, there are lots of Democrats in rural areas and um, I think they must feel pretty abandoned. So um, I think it's important to try to, to look at the parts of the country where um, there are enough Democrats um, and people who are independents to actually make a difference um, in those places politically because it wasn't very long ago that they were competitive and it really matters for democracy, it turns out. Yeah, um, if I could, tre Trevor, did you wanna say Trevor something? Jamila both wanna say a word? Yeah. Uh, no, go for it, Janelle. I'll say one, one, one thing after Janelle's done. All right. I was just going to chime in quickly in on this question of change, which I agree with Suzanne is the hardest question ever, um, and not the question that we're really trained as political scientists to answer well. Uh, but I wanted to pull together a few threads because I, I, I think they're related. Um, and so Jake was talking about sort of yes, take what you can get, but don't kind of lose sight of the kind of institutional and structural changes that might open up or create opportunities. And I think that that's true in the electoral realm, but it's also true from the vantage point, say, of organizations, which we've been talking about, and uh, from the vantage point of social movements, social movement organizing, and what have you. And so even, you know, some of the research that I've been doing with housing organizations uh, and talking to some organizers in rural areas who say, you know, there's just so little we can actually do, right? Because of this particular context, some of the context that Trevor and Suzanne have been pointing out in their papers. And many of them have said, we're not gonna try to do anything, to, to me have said, we're not gonna even try to do anything transformational policy-wise, we're just going to work on building um, shared knowledge and ideas in some of the communities here to get to a point where a year from now or two years from now or five years from now, we can actually exert pressure on the local level and build that up to the state level. So I think when we think about politics and organizing, thinking across levels, thinking over time about sort of feedback effects and feed forward effects and thinking about institutional change, but part of the work that it will take to get there is to work on ideas, right? And so housing organizers say to me, when you talk to people in rural areas about like social housing or decommodifying housing, you would think they would be like, no, that's socialism. And they're really like, hmm, tell me more, you know? But to, if they think it has to do with the Dems, that's not necessarily the reaction. So you have to build a different space for um, thinking and understanding and politics, and that's both ideational and institutional. It's hard work and it's medium to long-term work. So that's no like pass this policy and you'll get change, but it's part of the process that leads us there. Okay. Trevor? Yeah, Jamila, uh, that, that was a great segue into, to my point, which is that both you and Jacob really hit the, the head on the nail with um, revamping civic society. One finding that Suzanne and I have come across um, is that um, in rural areas where labor unions still do exist, there are some unions in rural areas. Those unions do tend to push non-Hispanic um, whites um, to moderate um, political views and vote Democrats. So labor reform is, is one, um, I don't want to say low hanging fruit, but it, it is one idea. And, and I agree with Jake and, and Jamila that, that revamping civic society in rural areas is, is really pressing. Right. Well, labor might be the highest hanging fruit in American politics, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, but I'm, I'm going to start wrapping things up. But um, I should, as by way of conclusion, I should uh, thank the Institute for Social Research and the Center for Political Studies here at the University of Michigan, because they, they co-sponsored and they helped promote this event. So thank you to them. Um, I want to let everyone know that our next event is actually, at this point, going to be an in-person event, our first in many, many moons. Uh, it's going to be held on the 10th floor of the International Institute building, and WCED postdoctoral fellow Brendan McElroy will be giving a talk entitled Institutions, Property Rights, and Growth, Theory and Evidence from the End of East European Serfdom, 
And that's going to be our first event of the year under WCED's annual theme, which is capitalism and democracy. And I think a lot of what we talked about today uh, could fit into that broader rubric of these questions of how democracy and capitalism inform each other. So to the audience, please stay tuned for more events on that theme, the capitalism democracy theme, as well as on continuing threats and vulnerabilities to American democracy uh, in the months to come. But most importantly, uh, sign off. So thank you, Jake Grumbach, Trevor Brown, Suzanne Mettler, Jamila Michener, Rob Lieberman, Rob Mickey, Tom Papinski, and most importantly to Derek Groom uh, for, as always, putting together an absolutely uh, fantastic, smooth process for us to be able to do this. So hope to see uh, lots of you um, throughout the year. We're all looking forward to the January special issues. It's going to be a lot of great stuff to read. Um, so everyone keep your eyes on the ball, a lot going on with American democracy, and we're going to keep watching it. So everybody take care. Stay safe, stay healthy. <laughs>